So thank you very much to, for coming to the seminar. Today we have Martin to speak with about the hottest topic now in PV, the power stack. So please welcome Martin. Thank you, Ziv. And thank you, Rob, for resetting the room up so quickly. That was uh, quite spectacular. Uh, yes, today I'll be talking about the emergence of uh, perovskite solar cells and as Ziv said this is one of the hottest topics in photovoltaics at the moment as you'll see. Um, as you all probably know I'm director of the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics that's funded by ARENA. But um, as you'll see the perovskites have emerged very rapidly like over the last two years as a force on the photovoltaic research area. And both uh, science and nature agree this is the biggest solar news of 2013. So uh, science each year picks out the breakthrough of the year and uh, the, the emergence of perovskites was not the winner but it was a runner-up top 10 as breakthrough of the year. Um, this is a young guy Henry Snaith who's um, done a lot of the good work as you'll see in the development of perovskites. And then nature about the same time picked the 10 people who had done the most significant work over the year and again Henry was again nominated for his work on perovskites. So I think if uh, perovskites can be turned into a commercial reality Henry's a certainty for a, a Nobel Prize. The significance of his work is, uh, is so great. We were relatively quick here to realise the potential of photovoltaics. As you'll see they, they have a certain um, match to silicon. And um, this is actually me last year, last September at the um, European Photovoltaic Conference. This is actually um, the first talk mentioning perovskites at the, at the major uh, European conference. So um, the photographer managed to get me just at the moment when I was introducing perovskites to the audience. Um, so as a result of, of that presentation and so on, we got involved in preparing a review article for Nature Photonics. And that's the reason for the talk today. This review has just been published on the Nature website, um, talking about the emergence of perovskite solar cells. Um, Alan Barnett was interested in it, so he said I sh he suggested I should give a seminar on it. Uh, unfortunately, Alan couldn't be here today. He's up heading up to the Great Barrier Reef, so um, <laughs> I'm giving the seminar anyhow. Uh, my co-authors on this are Anita Ho Bailey, who's down here in the front. I think you all know Anita. Anita did a lot of the background um, research needed to compile the the details that's presented in the in the article. Um, and uh, the other co-author is the man himself, uh, Henry Snaith, who's at Oxford uh, University. So what's all the fuss about? And this uh, graph probably summarises it um, pretty succinctly. Uh, this is efficiency up here, I lost my percentage mark, and this is the last eight years here. Um, so if you look at the thin film polycrystalline semiconductors like SIGS has long been the leader in terms of the highest efficiency. These are small area cells. So SIGS has been over 20% for a, a while now, as you can see here, but progress has been fairly slow. Cadmium telluride's actually caught up over the last few years, so it's had a real surge of activity and um, now also over 20%. But perovskites, the very first perovskite solar cell was made in 2006 and it was a pretty scrappy device, as we'll see. Um, but the, the, it was based on liquids and so on, so um, it wasn't very practical. But the first solid state device was made in mid-2012, so say two years ago. And then over the last, over 2000, 2013 in particular, there was very rapid development. Uh, the blue dots show the um, you know, claimed efficiencies for the devices. And as we'll see, that uh, can be a little bit dangerous with these devices doing your own in-house measurements. The black um, squares show independently confirmed measurements. So they're ones that you can really trust. But the highest independently confirmed measurement at the moment is 17.9%. So from um, you know, the first really operational solid state device two years ago, moved up to being in a situation where it looks like it might catch SIGs and cadmium telluride in the next year or two. You use your laser? Oh, sorry, Rob. Yeah, okay, I'll switch. I'll start pointing at this one now. 
Okay, so that's, that's the reason. It's um, technology that obviously has some very strong attributes to be able to, um, to be able to allow an efficiency improvement of that magnitude so quickly. So in the case of SIGs, it was a struggle through the 80s to get it to 10% and then 15% and then up to 20%. So it was a decades long job to get it to 20% efficiency and um, cadmium telluride, um, you know, the first cells were made in 1969 and slowly worked their way up to uh, 20%. So what's a perovskite? Um, perovskite actually is a, is a, a material having a specific um, crystallographic structure and this is the structure shown here. Um, generally involves three elements, uh, A, B and X, uh, common terminology for them. Um, and um, you, have th you have this very distinctive uh, open crystallographic uh, structure. The perovskite of interest is this material here. So it's methyl ammonium lead triiodide is the, is the chemical involved. So after a few times saying that sort of rolls off the tongue, but a bit of a mouthful to start with. Um, if you look at uh, this particular structure, there's, there's uh, restrictions on the elements that can form that structure because you need to have, you know, everything um, fitting in it, into its allocated spot for that to, to form. So you can do um, what's called a solid sphere model where you model each atom as being a, a rigid sphere based on the ionic ro radius of the material. That's an idea that's quite well developed in chemistry. But you can work out the geometrical, from geometrical considerations, what the size of these atoms need to be to be able to form this um, type of perovskite structure. And um, for all the different elements, this is just showing different groups, the periodic table. Um, for all the elements, it's sort of um, from the lattice spacing and different chemicals, you can work out the typical ionic radius of the different elements. But uh, iodine's down here, so it's one of the bigger elements in terms of its ionic radius. And uh, lead is down here, so it's even bigger. So it turns out that, and, and this, to form the perovskite, <coughs> this atom here has to be even bigger again. So that, um, or at least has to be bigger than the lead um, um, iron. So you need quite a large atom here. And um, that's why the, these um, organic molecules uh, or, or organic cations um, are needed to form perovskites with these, um, um, you know, with these particular elements, with the lead and the iodine. So it's quite an unusual structure. So it's um, it's a mixed um, organic, and this is the organic bit, inorganic um, compound involving both organic and inorganic materials. Um, if you don't conform to the exact Ge geometry that you calculate from that solid sphere model, you can still form the perovskites around a certain range, but you get sort of wobblier and wobblier structures as indicated here when you, when you do that. And um, so the crystallographic stability isn't as good. Um, you know, eventually um, you fall outside the range where you can form anything resembling the perovskite structure. Uh, but it, it's sort of seeming, I'm not sure if there's any good physical reason, but it's appearing that if you can lock the material into this um, uh, cubic type of perfect type of structure, you tend to get better chemical stability as well. So not only the crystallographic <coughs> stability um, is better, but it appears that the chemical stability tends to be better as well. But I'm not sure if there's a, any fundamental reason that should be so, but it just seems to be what the empirical evidence is suggesting. Now, just looking at the history of the perovskites, um, David Mitzi, some of you who are working on CZTS, copper, zinc, tin, sulfide solar cells, will know that David gave that field a big boost with his work on taking efficiency above 10% and everything. But before he got involved with the CZTS, he actually spent a number of years working on perovskites at IBM, trying to find practical applications for them in, uh, electronic, in, in electronic applications. So in particular, light emitting diodes and field effect transistors. So he did a lot of work, you know, was extending over a prolonged period where he explored the whole material system and ways of preparing the materials and so on. So um, even though his, um, his work did not directly lead to the present interest, it's been drawn on heavily by those that are involved in perovskite cell development. So they've thumbed through his papers in quite a bit of detail to 
get ideas for how the material might be prepared or improved and so on. This is one of his LEDs. I haven't been able to figure out exactly what, what's what in that device, but, but you can be guaranteed that if he had a bothered to shine light on it, he would have been able to measure some electrical output. So if he had have um, taken the trouble, he would have been able to claim he'd made the first perovskite solar cell. Um, he wasn't particularly interested in, in their application for solar for two reasons. One was that lead was involved in, uh, in the materials, a lot of the materials he was working with. And, um, you know, he's working with CZTS now, which is an environmental benign, earth abundant sort of semiconductor material. So he, he thought lead was a bit of a killer, having a toxic element within your solar cell. And uh, stability was the other issue. The, the lead compounds weren't particularly stable, but if you switch the lead for a related uh, element, tin, and the, the one underneath it in the periodic table, the stability became even worse. So that he said, you know, like I could get rid of the tin and have a better material for solar applications, but the tin makes it um, even less stable. <laughs> so he, he didn't think the potential for photovoltaics was particularly strong because of those two reasons. And these still remain as the two big negatives about the perovskite technology. The efficiency is great, but you've got lead in there in um, significant quantities, about 33% by weight is lead. And um, you have uh, issues with the stability that we'll talk a little bit about later on. Um, Henry um, was um, very heavily involved in the development of cells, and this is the history of development or evolution of the perovskite cells from his perspective. So Anita and I came up with a slightly different perspective for our review, so sort of a few things were happening in parallel to these developments that were also important. But the perovskites, um, the present interest at least, like David Mitzi's work, was independent of the um, present interest essentially, although it has contributed to the recent developments. Um, the, the origin was definitely disensitized solar cells. So I'm not sure if everyone here is familiar with the disensitized solar cells, but these were first reported in about 1991. And there's been a lot of interest, particularly in journals like Nature and Science in the disensitized cells. If you thumb through back issues of Nature and Science, you'll find just about any photovoltaic paper that's been published there is either on disensitized or organic uh, solar cells. Um, but the disensitized cell is a fascinating structure from the operational point of view, although in terms of practicality, I've never thought it had great prospects for commercial implementation for a number of reasons. Um, but this is essentially the structure here. So you have a glass substrate and then you put a conducting oxide. So fluorinated tin oxide is the one that's generally used. So that's just a you know, high band gap n-type semiconductor, essentially. And then um, the guts of the cell itself is, is this um, what's called mesoporous titania particles. So these are titania nanoparticles, about 20 nanometer diameter. So, you know, out of the quantum confinement regime, but, you know, the next, next size up, 20 nanometers sort of diameter. And these are just put down in a way that they form this very porous structure, such as shown here. Um, and then you, uh, you dip the, the glass with these layers on it into uh, a dye solution <coughs> and the dye attaches itself to the, to the titania, you know, as, as indicated here. So the titania, I should mention, is a, another high band gap n-type semiconductor material. So titanium dioxide n-type with a, with a band gap of um, multiple e electron volts. Um, and uh, and, th and these, these dyes are the active part of the device. They're the ones that absorb the light in the structure. So you've essentially got an n-type, you know, a, a heavily doped n-type semiconductor of these titania particles, and you've got these dye molecules attached. You then complete the circuit by this uh, electrolyte um, that is able to permeate through the porous structure, and it essentially provides the other polarity contact, the p-type contact to the device structure. And then you um, have another tin oxide layer and so on as the counter electrode. So, so what happens, how these devices work is the light comes in and gets absorbed by one of these dye molecules. The band gap of the titania is too large to absorb much. So all the absorption, all the useful absorption takes part in this very thin, you know, sort of monolayer 
or less sub monolayer coverage of the um, sub monolayer um, coverage of the surfaces of the titania particle. But you have a lot of surface because of the convoluted structure. So the absorption takes part there. An electron gets excited to a high state within the, within the dime um, molecule and is able to jump into the conduction band of the titania. It gets excited to above the conduction band edge and then it, the electron finds its way through this network to the um, negative contact over here. And then the circuit's completed by an electron being shuttled across this electrolyte to replenish the ground state of the dye. So you get the electron pumped up at the dye, um, percolating its way through the nanoporous network to the contact and then getting shuttled by this electrolyte across to the, um, across the dye. Um, so I, I guess there's really no p-n junction there. This is a n-type semiconductor, but there's no, really no p-type semiconductor there. So it's, you know, like an interesting device concept because it's completely different from a p-n junction that most um, people involved with photovoltaics would be familiar with. Um, the um, titania layer needs to be fairly thick because uh, dyes are fairly weak absorbers of light. So you, need, you have about 10 microns of this nanoporous network to absorb the light. So that, that structure is interesting from the operational point of view because it broadens your concept of what constitutes a photovoltaic device. But, um, you know, there's a few problems and one of them is the use of these electrolytes trying like, try to seal those in liquids in over a 25 year life that you have to guarantee a photovoltaic module for these days, um, you know, very difficult. Um, and there were stability issues and so on that um, were associated with the dyes and the electrolytes and so on. So, you know, not very promising in its own right, although many people um, around the world have been working on that structure. You know, one obvious thing to improve the structure was to get rid of the liquid. And uh, so this was um, solid state dye sensitized solar cells, which Henry Snaith actually worked on for his PhD. Um, so trying to get rid of the electrolyte by using a uh, solid material to permeate the dye, to, per to permeate the nanoporous network, which isn't easy because you, you know, the 20 nanometer spheres, you know, with very close spacing. So it's very hard to get the uh, solid through there. So generally put through as a liquid and then the liquid bits removed. Um, the um, material that worked best for this is a organic material, which can be thought of like a p-dipe doped organic semiconductor, but its um, chemical formula is incredibly complex. Like it takes at least a line to write it all out, but spiro is its um, uh, common abbreviation. Um, and uh, it, it uh, produces devices of acceptable performance or measurable performance, or maybe I should say, but it's like 5% efficiency is quite attainable with this type of structure, whereas about, I think 11% is the best confirmed efficiency for the liquid device. Um, actually, our partners in um, ACAP uh, down in Melbourne, um, Udo Bach, who um, is collaborating with us in the perovskite work, actually was the first to use this material in the solid state dye cells. So he's got a paper that's been cited a million times about introducing the spiro into the solid state dye cell. So this was Henry's background with this type of material. And um, when the perovskites emerged, he investigated this structure where you coat the device with a very thin layer of the perovskite material. So this is called um, ETA cell, which means extremely thin absorber. So that's just an idea that some people have talked about. You know, if you have a convoluted surface like this, you can make the semiconductor layer extremely thin, you know, like nanometers, multiple, you know, I guess tens of nanometers, five, you know, less than 10 nanometers even of material would be adequate. Um, so he investigated this structure and got uh, good results. Um, I'm not quite sure why he did it, but he then looked at replacing the titania by a non-semiconducting um, mesoporous material, so aluminum oxide. Um, so I'm not quite sure what stimulated that development, but it was a very important step forward, as you can see. So in here, the titania is the conductor that conducts the electrons that are 
generated within the perovskite layer to the, to the contact here. But in this structure, the aluminum oxide has a wider band gap and the electrons can't jump into the conduction band and so on. So it's just an insulator. So it meant that for this device to be operating, the electrons were actually finding their way to this contact here through the perovskite layer. So the perovskite layer was able to actually conduct electricity rather than just acting as a sensitizer that the dye sensitized field is quite familiar with. So that was um, a significant step forward, um, showing that you didn't, that the device operation wasn't relying on the titania and the perovskites had the ability to transport electrons and, and holes, I guess, to be able to complete the circuit. Um, and then the next step was even uh, bolder. It just got away completely from the structure from which the interest in perovskites had originated just to a very simple planar device structure shown here and was able to demonstrate 15% efficiency reported about May last year. So, you know, a little bit more than a year ago. <laughs> Some of these things sound like ancient history, but when you look at the actual time scales, you're talking about things that happened 12 months ago. So it's a field that's been evolving very rapidly. Um, so a very simple structure and the perovskite layer in this structure typically about 300 nanometers thick. So a very thin layer, you know, like a, some amorphous silicon cells have that type of thickness, but you know, not many other um, inorganic semiconductor materials are able to operate with such uh, thin thicknesses, but still retaining many of the materials that have been developed in the diasensitized cell area. So that's the evolution from Henry's perspective and his two very important contributions were showing that the titania wasn't needed and then that you could get efficient performance from this um, simple, very simple planar structure. So that's opened up the whole field. Um, no longer did you need to fiddle around with all this type of stuff. You could now just make a simple, you know, fair dinkum type solar cell and, um, and get good results. Uh, this is another one, this is a Henry sketch that I'll use to demonstrate, but this is just a more um, graphic description of the different structures. This is the diasensitized cell with the liquid. This is a solid state diasensitized. This is the ETA device where you have this black gunge, that's the perovskite, uh, coating the titania particles in a very thin layer, and then the simple planar structure shown there. So very black and absorbing the perovskite material. Um, the interesting thing about the perovskites, which um, to me demonstrates their robustness as a photovoltaic material. Like if you look at the inorganic semiconductors, you know, like SIGs is really difficult to find the right combination of preparation conditions that give you the very good properties. Whereas cadmium telluride has been a very robust material, like people have been able to make 10% cadmium telluride cells by a variety of different deposition approaches. Um, so cadmium telluride is clearly the most robust of the inorganic materials in terms of its flexibility and being able to make good cells from it or reasonable cells from it. But the perovskites take this to a whole new level. So with perovskites you can make 15% efficient cells any number of ways. So this was originally the most popular because it's the type of technique that the diasensitized cell and organic cell people use, um, liquid-based solutions, so just uh, sort of spin coating the different layers that are required within the cell structure. So that's still by far the most common way of making the perovskite devices. And this structure here is the one, I guess it's most closely related to this one, but a little bit different. It's the structure that has produced the best efficiency to uh, so far. So you have the titania layer, it's impregnated with perovskite, and then you have another solid perovskite layer on top of it. So it's like a combination of some of the device structures I talked about earlier. So that's actually the 17.9% device structure actually has that combined structure there. Although clearly I think this one's a, a more practical implementation. So that's liquid approach, which as I said, the majority of the field is still using. Um, Henry showed when he made this structure, the other important development was he showed that you could repair that structure by evaporation. So just, you know, simple solid state technology for preparing the layer. So that's, um, you know, sort of appealing to us in that, you know, we're familiar with evaporation. We know how to do it. We know how much it's likely to cost in production and so on. So it's, um, it's a technique that's well suited for um, conventional silicon type processing. 
And then the other technique is a vapor phase technique. So um, that also seems a very practical approach, but in this case you deposit part of the material, the, the lead iodide, onto the uh, substrate one way or another. So you can be from as spun on as a liquid or you can evaporate it or I don't think it'd be too critical how you put that on. And then you expose it to this uh, organic vapor and um, the, the vapor reacts with the precursor and you produce a perovskite layer. So these little hexagons, I think I meant just, just represent grains within the polycrystalline material that, that's produced. So I should mention this material generally forms polycrystalline structures, but the grain size is, is, is quite large. So, um, you know, in some of these structures where the perovskite's confined, it's, um, you know, maybe 100 nanometers grain size, but if you have a structure like this, it's generally sort of micron type grain sizes that are involved. So, um, you know, with this structure here, we're able to very quickly get quite good efficiency. So that's three completely different approaches and they've all given efficiencies now that are over 15%. Um, so that's just a demonstration that not too critical how you prepare the material. You don't need a secret recipe and just go for it. Um, uh, this is a drawing we use in our review paper of the structure. We've turned it up the other way so the light's coming from the top. We live in the southern hemisphere. It's a bit different in the northern where the light comes from the bottom. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, just, just recapping the layers, you've got the glass and then you've got the um, furinated tin oxide as a, as a contact. And then what you have here that I haven't talked too much about, but it's important to the perovskite cell operation, is a compact titania layer. So rather than being the mesoporous structure that I have talked about, this is a layer that's um, formed in sheet form, very high density, not, um, not porous at all. We, we prepare that generally at quite a high temperature, so 500 degrees, which is quite high when you're dealing with um, a lot of these materials. Um, and then, um, you know, you can go two ways or both ways. The best cells have been made with all these layers here, uh, a porous layer impregnated with perovskite, and then a continuous perovskite layer, and then uh, what's called a whole transport medium. So the titania acts as an electron transport material. It's n-type, so it's good at transporting electrons but not holes. Um, the whole transport me medium is generally that spiro material I mentioned. So it has, it has a property like a heavily doped p-type semiconductor. It's good at transporting holes but not electrons. So HTM stands for whole transporting material. So it's a bit like the P plus layer in the back of a silicon cell. And this is, this is a bit like the N plus layer at the front there. They're layers with asymmetrical transport properties, which, um, you know, one way of looking at how, what you need to make an operational cell. You need some way of getting electrons to go one way and holes to go the other. And then uh, generally gold or silver as the rear contact. So that's the typical structure. Um, this is the type of diagram that you see often in the, um, in the perovskite literature because um, the organic and diasensitized cell people that have contributed significantly to the uh, initial development of the perovskites sort of talk about these um, uh, diagrams which are really just showing the um, uh, electron affinity. This is electron affinity. This is meant to represent the band gap of the material. And this is the um, distance from the valence band edge to the um, vacuum work function here. The difference between the numbers there is the band gap of the material. So this is the uh, FTO, which is, acts like a high band gap n-type semiconductor. The TiO2, which is a, another high band gap n-type semiconductor. Then the perovskite, which can be NLP type, um, probably generally n-type, if I remember correctly. And then this is the um, whole transporting material, which acts like an electron block. And then this is the meant to be the gold uh, contact here, which doesn't really have a band gap. Um, but you can see that you get this um, sort of gradient down here that electrons flow downhill when they're generated within the perovskite. So there's a natural tendency to flow this way. And for whole energy, it's up the other way. So the holes sort of have a downhill flow if they go uphill. So they sort of, you know, everything's tuned to, um, to allow the flow. So these diagrams are used very frequently in the OPV literature in particular. So no um, 
potential variations in the material, probably because they're not really understood. So you just have a you know, constant potential across the material as indicated there. Um, to look at the operating principles, this is um, another set of diagrams produced by uh, this group here, Korean group. Um, Park here contributed significantly to the uh, early development of perovskites. This mis misses out one early stage of development, which was this type of structure here, which has what should now be familiar um, for an tin oxide and then the mesoporous titania. But rather than coding continuously with um, perovskite like Henry Snaith did, the initial devices just had little quantum dots. So you had these 20 nanometer diameter tania particles covered by these little quantum dots of like two to three nanometer perovskite particles. So the very first perovskite cells actually had that type of structure. Um, so that was essentially where it started. So um, one guy actually measured the number on one of these dots and found 18 quantum dots on a, on a bigger titania dot. So um, you know, pretty similar to what this drawing shows. So there's two structures on this side. If you look at their operation, it's what's very familiar to uh, dye-sensitized and to some extent organic people where it's an interfacial device where um, you don't have to worry about the transport in the perovskite. Everything just happens at the, you know, it's just sort of, it has no bulk. So it's just sort of all interfacial effects that are occurring. So this is meant to represent the perovskite with its band gap and a photon comes in and excites an electron across the band gap and uh, to an energy level where it can drop down into the conduction band of the TiO2. So that's um, desirable processes and then you need to replenish the electron here from the whole transport material or you send a hole the other way if you want to talk in terms of holes. So the blue ones are the desirable transports and then you've got all these other process that's getting in the way. You've got uh, recombination occurring within the perovskite and then you know even though it's um, very thin you can still get recombination within it and then you've got all these interfacial um, processes occurring where you know electrons are going in directions that you really would prefer they didn't. So that you know that's the way the operation can be thought of for these devices and many people in the field are used to this way of thinking of device operation. But um, for these devices here that have substantial continuous layers of perovskite, you've got to get the transport through the perovskite. So the transport properties of the perovskite become important. And it looks much more like a traditional semiconductor. So um, a lot of the um, thinking about um, how conventional inorganic cells operate, I think can be applied to the thinking about this structure, but because of the background of many of the materials entering the field, coming from the dye-sensitized and organic area, this mode of thinking about operation is foreign to many of them. So it's, a, it's like new information to many that are working on perovskites at the moment. Uh, but one group that um, I think Technion in Israel actually um, did something similar to what we've done with our silicon cells, just probed it using uh, EBIC to, um, to find out how the response varied across the perovskite layer when you had a structure like this. So we've got the, this layer is on this side in this case. So they scanned it with electron beam and you just sort of measure the current that you get out. So it's pretty much like scanning it with light, but with light of a more controlled um, diameter than, than it's easy to get optically. Um, so this is what they measured. So you, you start getting a response when the electron beam is in the titania, so there may be some response from the titania. And then it dips down. This proviscite layer was deliberately thicker than the 300 nanometers that generally used, about five times thicker. So as you get to the middle of the proviscite, the electrons that are generated by this E-beam have trouble getting over to the contacts. So that's just like a diffusion length type of effect. And then over near the whole contact, there's um, another little peak here, but a dip at the whole contact. Um, so you can, you can show that this dip at the whole transport medium means that this whole transport material isn't acting very ideally. It's got a high recombination of carriers at the interface there, and that's the reason for the dip there. But as you get away from the interface, the uh, carriers can, st can uh, get collected despite that um, property. So, um, you know, it acts pretty much the same as what you'd get from a traditional semiconductor if you did a similar experiment. 
So um, Anita and I, for this review paper, did what we believe is the very first energy band diagram of a perovskite device. I don't know no one's been brave enough to do that before, but this is, we figure it's just acting like a traditional inorganic semiconductor. So we just drew the band diagram um, the same as you would for an inorganic semiconductor, just um, using simple rules about the continuity of things across interfaces and so on. Um, Anderson's rule and the Mott rule for um, insulator interfaces. But uh, just assuming a continuity of the electron affinity across the, uh, well, you've got continuity of the Fermi level and then just assuming um, you know, the appropriate conditions for the electron affinities at the interfaces or you need to draw a band diagram like this. So we figure over near the whole transport material, it's p-type equivalent properties are uh, inducing an accumulation of uh, electrons near that, um, uh, sorry, of holes near that interface, depletion of electrons. So you're getting the whole concentration going up at the interface. And then over at the end type, you're getting a, a um, accumulation of electrons. Um, and if the device, you know, and these high field regions correspond to the high collection efficiencies and in this EBIC signal here. And if you make the devices thinner, these two regions merge and you eventually end up with a constant field across the device and the limit of very thin devices. So we think that's all understandable. So we're just trying to do work that uh, verifies this type of band structure is appropriate in explaining the things like the transient properties of the material. Um, looking at the features of the perovskites that make them uh, such good solar cells, one is a uh, low recombination within the perovskite, so very low internal recombination rates, even though the material, as I said, can be prepared by a number of ways that are generally give you quite crappy material if you're dealing with anything else. You can get material that has low recombination. So this was, um, the dark green line there is actually the EQE of the first um, independently measured perovskite solar cell, which we, pub we published the curve last year so it's only 12 months ago that this curve was published, but this just shows the EQE. So from the EQE, you can figure out the band gap. Um, you know, it's just where the absorption edge kicks in. So this is the low energy side here. So you're just getting above the band gap where the EQE starts rising. So um, interesting about this slide is we've compared two other semiconductors. There's two other records coincidentally at the same time. Um, this is a gallium indium phosphide which is one of the more efficient uh, devices in terms of having very low non-radiative recombination within its volume. After gallium arsenide, it's the next best that anyone has um, made so far. Um, and then this is cadmium telluride, which is a semiconductor that has now had, well, getting on to 50 years of uh, development and approaching 20% efficiency, as I mentioned. So you can figure out their band edges, you know, roughly from those EQEs. But then if you look at their open circuit voltage, the difference between the open circuit voltage and this band edge is a measure of the amount of non-radiative recombination that's occurring within the device structure. So it's a very simple metric. So with the, um, the gallium indium phosphide, it's really good. So you're getting you know, 1.8 EV band gap, but the um, open circuit voltage is 1.45. So it's only like 350 millivolts difference between those two. So that's, that's showing that most of the recombination or a large part of the recombination of the material is radiative. Um, with the um, cadmium telluride, where is it? Which one is it? First solar, 16.2. I guess it's this one. No, it must be this one here. Um, so you're getting you know, below 0.9 EV when you've got 1.45 EV band gap, so you've got, you know, like over 550 millivolts difference between the two. So it's got a lot more non-radiative recombination occurring within it. But the perovskite, and even this one, this was a 14% efficient perovskite, and the 18% one's a lot better. Even in the, these very early stages, it's got 1.6 EV band gap and an open circuit voltage already um, that 550 millivolts <coughs> different. So already at this stage of development, it was good as cadmium telluride in terms of its 
non-radiative recombination properties and, and since then it's improved by about an order of magnitude. So it's now about an order of magnitude better than cadmium telluride in terms of the amount of non-radiative recombination that's occurring in the material compared to um, the minimum that you could get. So, you know, very low recombination rates. And uh, the reasons for that aren't all that clear, but the, gra the grain boundaries seem to be very um, recombination inactive. So the grain boundaries are very benign, whether it's to do with the sloppy crystal structure or what the precise reasons for that aren't known. And then a lot of defects in the material are shown not to produce um, high densities of defects near the mid gap, which are the, the main cause of non radiative recombination. So there seems to be some theoretical support for most of the defects lying away from the mid gap, but more work will clarify what the re that reason is. The other strength is strong absorption, and this is a graph that Anita compiled, but a um, lot of the traditional solar cell materials included here, uh, as well as two perovskites. So both the uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide, that's the more, most common one, it's shown as the brown curve there, and then this um, mixed um, compound that in involves substituting some of the iodine by chlorine. Um, so actually the, there's no real evidence that they have a lot different absorption coefficients. We just included those two to give an idea of the range of absorption properties. And pretty much spans that of the 3,5 and 2,6 uh, materials. So cadmium telluride is this blue one here. Um, gallium arsenide, which is the, eight, is the typical um, direct band gap semiconductors, this one here, so probably better than gallium arsenide, maybe better than <coughs> cadmium telluride. Indium phosphide, quite a strong absorber. This, the, the record is held by CIS, copper indium diselenide, which has really strong absorption as shown here. So not as quite as good as CIS, but you know, probably better than gallium arsenide in terms of the strength of optical absorption. Uh, this is a paper that was published um, way before the interest in solar applications, but this just shows the, essentially the absorption coefficient as you reduce the temperature. And at low temperatures, you get these little bumps in the absorption curve that sort of get washed out as you go to high temperature. And that's uh, generally attributed to exotonic effects. So um, with a lot of people coming from the organic solar cell background, there's been a lot of interest in how important are exotonic effects in these perovskites because um, the exotonic effects dominate in the organic PV. However, if you compare it to um, gallium arsenide, you see some interesting differences. So this is gallium arsenide as a function of temperature. So you see the exotonic peak, and this is all very well understood for gallium arsenide, at low temperatures. And then as you go to higher temperatures, it gets washed out, so you can hardly see it at room temperature. So that's sort of similar to what you're seeing here. Um, this is both... Um, photon energy increasing in this direction here. But you notice all these curves are shifting in this direction, whereas these ones are tending to shift this way, and then do a jump, and then shift that way again as you go up in temperature. What that means is the band gap of the material tends to increase with temperature rather than decrease. It, it stems from the fact that the states that make the conduction band in the perovskites are, the, are similar to the states that make the valence band in the 3-5 semiconductors. So you tend to get this opposite trend of the band gap from the traditional semiconductors. This jump here, where the, essentially the band gap jumps from a value like this to this, sudden decrease in the band gap is due to a, a phase change in the perovskite material. It's sort of had a wobbly structure at low temperature, and as the temperature got up, it sort of stiffened up into a less wobbly device structure, um, which changed the, the band gap of the material. Um, so um, Armin, one of our PhD students, is working on interpreting these absorption curves to try and work out the exotonic binding energy. But the preliminary results are that it's not particularly high. So it's not much higher than in, in silicon, for example, where exotonic effects are insignificant at room temperature. So unlike OPV, um, it seems the exotonic effects are, you can essentially ignore them in, um, in these devices. The other property, I better get a move on so there's time for questions, but the other interesting property, potential property is, is the material ferroelectric? So just to refresh your memory, for a ferroelectric material, you apply electric field to it and little black microscopic domains in the material align to the field so that when you remove the field, you're left with a remnant uh, polarization shown here. So you get you know, the uh, 
affected the field sort of um, remaining even though it's been removed. And if you go the other direction, you get field in the opposite direction. This is just something I found on the web, but it's like having a little battery. You know, you, you get one polarity in one direction, opposite polarity when you go the other way. So a uh, non-viable and reversible polar state. But uh, if you think about it, having a little battery in a solar cell mightn't be too bad an idea. <laughs> you could then generate more electricity apart from that just coming from the sun, which is an important consideration when you're measuring these devices, as we'll see. Um, this is just the um, refractive, oh, I better skip over this bit, but the refractive index of the perovskite as a function of temperature and this very dramatic change at about 160 um, Kelvin is indicative of a ferroelectric to a paraelectric um, change where you don't get the permanent built in but you get a really giant um, value of the dielectric constant. You take the square root of this and you get the refractive index. So you're talking about refractive indices over 10 here, which is really quite enormous. And then by room temperature, it's relaxed down. But this type of temperature decay is typical of a paraelectric material. Um, so if you look at the um, dielectric properties of these material, it's completely different from silicon. Like silicon has a value of 11.4 at low frequencies going to 11.7 at high frequencies, at optical frequencies over here. So it's really very static um, with uh, frequency. But here, in the, um, this region here, everything within here is responding to the electric field at the low frequencies. Like this molecule is wobbling around and all the ions are oscillating with respect to each other and the electrons within the ions are moving around. So you get this giant permittivity value here. And then um, as the frequency goes up, this molecule here can't respond. So you go to a new plateau. And then finally at optical frequencies, only the electrons can respond and you get a, another plateau down here. But interestingly, th like this is the value that you'd have to use in calculating things like static fields in the material and so on. So you know, a lot different results from calculations than you'd get with silicon. Um, how important all this is is solar cell operation is not understood at the moment. But uh, there is something that you might expect from ferroelectric effects occurring in the device terminals, although there's many other possible explanations as well. But if you measure a solar cell, if you go from short circuit to open circuit, you tend to get this droopy looking curve, but come back the other way, be you suddenly get good efficiencies. Um, so this graph here just shows the energy conversion efficiency. You probably can't see it, but this is 16% here and this is 12 versus the thickness of the mesoporous layer. So this is one of these devices with combined structures and this was found to affect the amount of hysteresis for some reason. But um, if you measure coming back this way, you'll get close to 16% regardless of how much of this titania you have. However, if you measure going from short circuit, you'll get a big difference between the devices. Um, so it's very important how you measure these devices, which is why you should be a little skeptical of, the, of results claimed by research groups that have measured their own. They're almost certainly talking about this efficiency here, not this one here. <laughs> um, the testing labs are presently taking an average of the two to determine the overall efficiency. So the 17.9% was actually 18.3 going this way and 17.5 going the other way. Um, but whether you, know, whether you could imagine um, designing a biasing circuit or something periodically um, putting the device into the correct state to get this curve all the time, um, you know, interesting <coughs> question. Moving on, just want to talk about a few other properties. Alloying, so you can, as I mentioned before, you can replace some of the iodine by other uh, halides. So bromine has been the one that allows complete miscibility. So you can form mixed compounds over the whole range of compositions of iodine and bromine. And uh, as you add more bromine, this is none over this side, going up to 100% bromine, you uh, increase the band gap. So you can dial up a band gap by controlling the amount of bromine, just the same as you can in the 3-5 materials by alloying. Um, you know, there's different colours of the samples. So that's a very useful property. You're not stuck with a one band gap. You can mix these materials to produce different band gaps and you can see the results in the IV curves and so on. I won't go into the detail there. So this is just a range. You can like uh, substitute the iodine 
for bromine as indicated here or chlorine as we mentioned before or you can substitute the lead um, by tin as I also mentioned before but the um, tin compounds tend to be less stable lower band gap but less stable or you can substitute the organic material so this is methyl ammonium you can go for ethyl ammonium which has more carbon in it bigger bigger molecule that produces a a more stable cubic structure more readily um, and so on so you can try other organic molecules in the place of this one here so there's this whole huge parameter space by alloying different things and you could even think about germanium or silicon in the place of the group four elements so interesting prospects there the other thing I should touch upon is stability this is from that same paper but um, this is the device performance as measured so the black one is with no bromine in the material under 35% humidity at room temperature, if I remember correctly. So it didn't, didn't really like the 35% humidity, but if you gave it 55%, liked it even less, and then just sort of continually kept degrading after 20 days. So not quite 20 years, but 20 days, you know, <laughs> it, it degraded down to, uh, you know, like a um, very low percentage of its original performance. But by adding bromine, the, the stability improved. So, um, uh, you've got to be a little bit sceptical about claims of stability in this literature as well. Um, like Professor Gretzel who invented the disensitized cell has always claimed they're stable, but anyone that's ever measured one independently has found they're not. So um, despite the literature proving that they're stable, uh, experimental evidence sort of points to the opposite. Um, and I think it's pretty similar with these materials too. You've got to be a little, little bit, bit sceptical about claims of stability. So that's one big problem. Okay, I'll just finish off. Yeah, got two minutes. Talking about manufacturing costs. This is just my graph showing the reported manufacturing costs by different manufacturers for function time. So most of them are silicon. The interesting one is the um, thin film one for solar. So silicon's got you know clear path to further cost reduction. With the thin film, I like first solar. I've been at it for years, and they're doing a very good job. And uh, two and a half hours from glass coming into a module coming out so very efficient production of these thin film modules so hard to see how you can do much better than they're doing they've had a cost reduction over recent years but if you look at the reason for that it's mostly because they've increased their efficiency they haven't changed the cost of making these modules they've just got more power out of them Enrol did an analysis and sort of came to the same conclusion and the the reason is this is their costing of a device in 2011 around here somewhere this uh, blue bit shows the material costs that go into the module. So um, uh, there's not much you can do about them. They're glass, junction boxes, and you know, tabbing, uh, encapsulating materials to glue the glass sheets together, the glass sheets, the fluorinated tin oxide coated glass that's used in the top surface of this module as well. So there's all these costs that are common to all thin film technologies that go into the, into the uh, cadmium telluride module. So I can't see that perovskites are going to have any advantage there. You're going to perhaps need better encapsulation because of all the moisture sensitivity. So you're stuck with this big blob of the costs. This shows um, how First Solar could reduce their costs, which is by increasing the efficiency further. So if you um, look at these curves here, they're essentially just scaled versions of each other. So there's a scope for a little bit of fiddling around in terms of the cost of factories and so on that you need to make these devices. but you're sort of playing in the noise in terms of reducing the cost. So the way to beat cadmium telluride cost is not to have a lower cost deposition approach, but to have a more efficient device structure. So that's, that's the point that I want to make there. Um, so if you could first suddenly um, double the performance of cadmium telluride without adding to all these built-in material costs, you know, you'd end up with um, something more like this as your cost on the right side of the established technology. So I think that's where the attraction of these perovskites might lie, not in the fact they can be deposited very simply, but they might provide a path to performing high efficiency devices. I prepared a little bit more material than I've got time for, so I'll just sort of briefly go over the rest. We're here very interested in applying them to silicon, so that was the reason for our initial interest. So if you can stick them on top of silicon, you can get the benefit of tandem cell structures. So you go from something with a 30% sort of efficiency limit up to something with closer to 50% by sticking two perovskite cells on silicon. 
which is feasible within the material yeah. systems that have already been identified. So you might end up with a practical cell of 40% efficient. So that's our device structure. Uh, Ibrahim he's here has done some modelling of it and he suggests if we combine our best silicon cell with the best independently measured perovskite cell, we'd end up with a, something pretty close to 30% efficiency at the present state of development. So, um, and if you go to, um, you know, that's a little formula for how you might estimate that efficiency. So if you go to even lower quality silicon cells, you can still end up with quite a f uh, reasonable efficiency. Okay, end of talk. Uh, exciting time for perovskites. The competitive advantage, like to commercialise the technology, it needs to have a strong competitive advantage over the opposition. So low cost fabrication, as I said, I don't think that's a major advantage because of the fact in any professional system you've got all these fixed costs that are unavoidable. Trans uh, transparent and flexible product, it looks quite interesting for that, but how big is that market, I guess, would be my question. Uh, ability to form tandems, and that's, a, I think, a really interesting feature. Not to mention that there's still two problems, the moisture sensitivity, sensitivity and toxicity of lead. So sorry for going over time, but that brings me to the end of the talk. Thank you. Hey, I'd be pleased to answer any questions, but those that have to leave, please do so. Understand why the, when you replace the ivy in the bromine, you get um, more greater stability. And when you say the bromide perovskites um, are more stable, like what's the longest stability period that they measure? Yeah, um, so probably um, probably that graph I showed there, that 20 days. You know, my, like people are, are testing these things more seriously, but that's probably one of the longer periods that's been published. But the um, it's interestingly, the, the bromine is a smaller molecule and that sort of forms a more, um, more easily forms a cubic structure. Uh, so that could be related to stability or it might just be something to do with the reactivity of bromine compared to chlorine. So not too certain of the reason for the stability um, of the bromine compared to the iodine. Um, adding chlorine similarly is claimed to improve the stability. So. Um, it seems like the iodide is the worst, but it's um, you know, very tolerant material, as, as mentioned. But that's quite interesting, because you think, because the stability problem is meant to be due to water ingress. Yes. So, so it's not like a steric hindrance issue. Like the bigger, the bigger yeah, the yeah. molecule seems... Yeah, I, I think there's probably a chemical origin, so I'm not sure if the, anyone's elucidated the precise mechanism, but um, it's just been... Um, reported to us that we've been successful with a ARENA application to investigate perovskite tandems more thoroughly, so we'll be certainly looking at the stability a lot more closely. Yes, Torsten. What sort of size are we talking about when you talk about the highest efficiency devices? What, what area do they have? Oh, yes, the, the areas are quite small, so no one has um, had an independent measurement on a one square centimetre device yet, so these are all like 0.1 square centimetre device structures. The, 17.9 device was 0.09 square centimetres or three millimetres by three millimetres. So I think it's just a technical thing. You just make a little simple picture frame bus bar uh, without needing any fingers for your, um, for your fluorinated tin oxide um, conducting oxide. So it's just you know, a simple picture frame device structure suffices to, um, to, do a, to, to, to make a three millimetre square device. There, there are issues with uniformity, particularly with the liquid coating technique. So getting uniform thickness has been one of the challenges. And in fact, uh, Henry Snaith has turned that to advantage in that he's been able to coat glass sheets non-uniformly and get um, semi-transparent modules. So quite an interesting way of forming semi-transparent modules by having you know, zero thickness in some regions and enough thickness in other regions to, to get power out. Um, but the liquid approach is, um, you know, that's one reason we're interested in the uh, evaporation. We think we'll be able to get much more uniform films than in the liquid approach. But that vapour phase approach should also give good uniformity. Would you initially try your silicon tendons also on that sort of size, or would you try to go for bigger size? I didn't quite catch the last bit. Would you try to go for similar size devices initially when you do your silicon tendons, or...? Yeah, whatever it takes, so... <laughs> 
the first aim is to, you know, like we have, um, we have certain efficiency milestones, so we won't be too fussy about how we achieve those. Well, we'll be fussy, but not overly fussy. Yes, Rob. Martin, when you have uh, morphous silicon on a silicon cell, too thin and it doesn't pass fake the surface, too thick and it absorbs too much light. What will this do to silicon? Can you make, one, does it actually pass fake the surface? And two, if it gets too thick, will it not let the light through? Yeah, it, um, it'll be acting as an independent cell. So you probably want the opposite of it passivating the surface. You want a really cruddy interface form that provides an electrical connection between the perovskite cell and the silicon cell. So we, we'll be looking at really bad interfaces between those two devices to try and just get an electrical contact between them. Um, but the thickness, um, uh, like we'll be trying to produce current balance devices. So by controlling the thickness of the perovskite, you can control the number of photons that get through to the silicon. So you can control the balance of absorption between the perovskite and the silicon by controlling the thickness. And also by adding bromine, we can control the band gap, which will also allow some flexibility in that area. So we'll be trying to get the same number of photons absorbed in the perovskite as in the, as in the silicon. So it, it, yeah, so the, the perovskites that are absorbed, the photons that are absorbed in the perovskite aren't, aren't wasted, like in a heat cell where you use amorphous silicon passivation, the ones absorbed in the amorphous silicon are wasted, whereas in the perovskite, they're actually put to good use. Yes, John. Um, yeah, you mentioned replacing the lead with uh, tin, I think, and that uh, yes. hadn't, hadn't yielded good results so far. But I'm just wondering, um, can you give us an idea of, of the level of work that's going into that sort of thing at the moment? Is there a big push towards replacing, re replacing lead, or, and, and what do you think the prospects are in doing so? Yeah, no, no we're very interested in replacing the uh, lead. But uh, as I said, you get a less stable material. And for our review, we actually had to explain why that was the case, which we did, but I forget the explanation now. That it's something to do with the, the way the tin um, oxidizes more readily than the, than the lead. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, it's possible that, like I, I don't think you can rule out the fact you can produce um, variants of this material that are more stable, or at least um, what we're trying to do is develop an understanding as to why the material is so good and then look at the prospects for synthesizing other material that's equally as good. You know, is it the fact that there's such a sloppy crystallographic structure or, you know, what's the real reason that the material is performing so brilliantly? And then can we get another material system that's, you know, perhaps a better choice of elements than in the perovskites to synthesize something similar? <coughs> yes. Sorry, the 40% efficiency in the tandem cell versus yes. Ebrogen's 29% calculated efficiency. That figure comes from where? Is that just a theoretical Shockley Quasar limit? Yeah, yeah, for the 29% figure, we're just assuming that the perovskite cell absorbs pretty much as it is in the discrete device, but the photons that it's not absorbing get through to the silicon cell structure, and then we're just extracting series resistances and shunt resistances and things from the original device characteristics and using them to simulate the effect of the reduced currents you'd have and reduced voltages that you'd get out of the devices. So it's fairly realistic, except we've um, assumed fairly favorable optical conditions. And the 40% is? The 40% is uh, assuming that we can get the same fraction of the attainable efficiency as we've been able to get with silicon. So there doesn't seem to be any reason that that mightn't occur because I think eventually the perovskites will end up with a higher radiative efficiency than, than silicon. So the best silicon devices, the HIT cells, have a radiative efficiency of about 2%. At the moment, the best perovskite has 0.06% radiative efficiency, but that's improved an order of magnitude over the last you know, 12 months or less, six months. So um, it's likely to get up to 2% or even better, I think. So it has the potential to perform a cell closer to the theoretical limit. You know, the, the more you improve that radiative efficiency, the closer you can get to the Shockley quasar limits that are essentially radiative limits. More questions? So before we thank Smarty, I just remind you if you can just sign <laughs> on the way out. And thank you very much to Martin. Thank you.